Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. This is another seminar by the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Juan Antonio Fernández Sontiveros from CEFCA in Teruel, in Aragón. And he will talk about X ray binary equation state in Arctic galactic nuclei, sensing the accretion disk of SMBH with the mid infrared nebular lights. So, as an introduction, I will read a few lines about uh, Jose Antonio, Juan Antonio uh, Antiveros, and he is from El Farwe here in Granada. He studied physics here at the University of Granada before moving to La Laguna in the Canary Island to accomplish his degrees with orientation in astrophysics. During his PhD, 2005-2010, at the Instituto Astrophysica in Canarias, he studied the central region of near, uh, nearby active galactic nuclei, using high angular resolution techniques in the optical to infrared range. Supervised by Dr. Salmodena Prieto and Jose Acosta Pulido. Uh, he then moved to the Instituto, Institute of Space Astrophysics of Planetology in NAF, IAP, Rome, in Italy, to specialize on spectroscopy in the mid to far infrared range with Professor Luigi Spinovio producing a spectroscopic atlas of AGN source observed by the Spitzer and Herschel satellites. Um, after a third, a third postdoc at the IIC, he moved uh, to Athens for a six month research stay at the uh, National Observatory and the National and uh, Capodistrian University to, to work with Dr. Calliope uh, Basila. Uh, then he moved, uh, finally, last July, he started a tenure track position at the Center of Studio de Física del Cosmos in Aragón, the CEFCA, in Teruel, Spain, and where he is currently working on the G plus and G pass surveys carried out at the Havalambra Observatory, an unprecedented survey of the northern sky covering thousands of square degrees in several globes and intermediate band filters. So today he will talk about X-ray, X-ray binary equation states. And uh, Juan Antonio, um, when you want, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, thank you very much, Rene, for the for the introduction. Before starting with the with the talk, I would like to to thank the the, the IAA here in Granada for the for inviting me as visitor and. Uh, I, I would like to, to give a, a short overview of the work that, that we are doing here with Borja Perez Dia, Enrique Perez Montero, and, and Pepe Vilche. Uh, we started a collaboration last year during the pandemic uh, to develop uh, new methods to determine chemical abundances using the infrared lines in the, the, the nebular lines in the infrared spectrum. These are lines observed with uh, Herschel and Spitzer satellites and they are compared to photoionization models of star forming regions, AGNs, and also we are introducing the, the treatment for, for shocks to determine, to measure the chemical abundances. And this, this was a very fruitful collaboration. And actually we, we already published the first, uh, first paper of, of, this, uh, of this method for the star forming regions that you can uh, find in this web page. The code is in Python and it's very easy to, to use. So you can just introduce a, a input, a, a table with the flux lines, and then the, the code provides you with, a, with an estimate of the uh, oxygen abundance, the nitrogen, nitrogen over oxygen abundance, and the ionization parameter. In the figure on the right, I'm showing uh, uh, some results for the comparison between the chemical abundances obtained with the infrared method and the same method using the optical, the optical lines. As you can see, the, the both methods are, are in agreement with uh, some scatter of about 0. 0. 0.15 dex. Uh, I would like to, to emphasize that the, the difference that you see here is not 
uh, relate to uncertainties in the method, but it's mostly due to the fact that infrared and optical lines are proving different regions in the nebula of these galaxies. And as, a, as an example, um, pointing here to the, to the galaxy NGC 3198, this is a galaxy for which we uh, recover higher uh, metallicities in the, in the infrared than in the optical. And when you look at the images of, of this galaxy, you can you realize that in the, in the mid, near to mid infrared, there is a strong bright uh, nuclear region, but it's much fainter in the optical. So uh, in this case, the, the difference between the optical and the, and the infrared abundance is mostly due to the fact that the, the central region of the galaxy is contributing to the chemical abundances in the infrared, but in the optical, uh, the, the external blue regions in the star forming regions in the arm, they are, they are contributing more. The, the, this is one of the big abundances of the infrared that it allows you to peer through the dust obscure regions in galaxies and, and measure the chemical abundances there. Another big advantage is the temperature because the infrared lines depart from energy levels that are closer to the ground state they have a much, uh, a much smaller dependency with the temperature when compared to the optical lines. Uh, typically, uh, with a, even in cold plasmas with a few thousand Kelvin, you already form the infrared lines and their emissivity does not depend so strongly on the temperature. While in the optical lines, you, the, the emissivity of the lines is a strong function of the, of the electron temperature in the plasma. And the third big advantage is the, the determination of the nitrogen over oxygen abundance. Nitrogen has a twofold origin. It's an element that it's produced by massive stars, but it also has a secondary production channels, channeling intermediate mass stars. And in the far infrared, you have lines for nitrogen three and oxygen three uh, between 52 micron and 88 micron. And the ratio of these lines is, is very little depending on models. It's not affected by obscuration and it's not uh, affected by temperature. So it allows you to, to determine very precisely the N over O abundance of, of your nebula. So the, this, this uh, method can be, can be used for, for many studies in galaxy evolution or, or particularly if you are invest, interested in, in dust embedded regions. And one of the science cases that we have been developing is the, the study of the chemistry in AGN driven winds. Uh, we, we obtained four hours of observation in the, in the James Webb cycle one to study the, the chemistry in the, in the wind of ESO 420 G13. This is a post starburst galaxy with a massive outflow of molecular gas uh, detected in ALMA images that you can, you can see is the red region in, in, this in this figure, in this map. And it has a counterpart in ionized gas, in, in, in this case, in, in neon two. Uh, with the James Webb data, we are going to investigate the, the chemistry of the wind launched by the, by the AGN in the center of this galaxy. And this is very interesting because this, uh, this mechanism can act as a regulator of the chemical evolution in galaxies because it's, it is able to eject heavy elements forming the central part of the galaxy to the outer disk or to the circumgalactic uh, gas. So if you are interested in, in using these tracers, uh, do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, and, and if you are at IAA, come, come by to the I'm working with, an, with the, at the same office that Enrique Perez. So uh, pass by and, and we can talk uh, further about, about this. Now I'm going to, to start with the, with the talk uh, about accretion states in AGM. This is a project in which I worked for some time. We discussed for, for a long time with Theo Muñoz Darias at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. And we came up with, a, with an idea to, to prove the presence of the accretion disk in, in supermassive black holes using the nebula lines in the medium infrared. So first of all, the, the existence of accretion states in stellar mass black holes is, is established in, in, in these low mass systems. 
Uh, very nice examples are low mass X-ray binaries. These are systems formed by a compact object, a neutron star or a black hole, and a late uh, star, late type star companion. The, the companion stars transfer material through the Roche lobe to the disk of the compact object. And during most of its lifetime, of, of its lifetime the system remains in a quiescent state. So the, the disk, the accretion disk is built little by little and the, the compact object is in a low luminosity state, uh, several times lower than Eddington luminosity. At a certain point, the, the disk is, is complete. The unthermal instabilities in, this, in, in the disk drive these systems into an outburst state in which the disk become very bright, it's, it completely outshines the companion. And in fact, these systems are, are very bright in the X-rays. They are, they are among the brightest sources uh, during, in the sky during, during an outburst. And the, at the, uh, during the outburst, the system is at, at a luminosity closer to the Eddington limit. And then it, this situation may last for a month to, to a year. Uh, uh, when, when the, and when the outburst end, the system comes back to quiescence and the cycle starts again. Nevertheless, the, the, these two states can be better studied using the hardness luminosity diagram. This is a representation of the X-ray luminosity of the system against the spectral slope in the X-rays. Due to the, due to the lower mass of the black hole, of the stellar mass black holes, the disk is much hotter when compared to AGNs. And so the disk emission peaks in the X-ray range. That's why uh, with an X-ray spectrum, you can characterize the balance between the disk emission and the jet corona emission at higher energies. So the soft state is a state in which the disk dominates, the spectrum is softer, and, and the corona uh, it's, uh, it dominates only at higher energies. During the hard state, the disk recedes or disappears complete, completely, and the spectrum is mostly dominated by inverse Compton emission from this jet or, or corona system. So in the hardness luminosity diagram that you see on the right, uh, it is represented the, the, the full cycle for a famous source, GX3394, during uh, 400 days, which is the, the, the period of the, of the full, of the full um, uh, quiescence to outboards and back to quiescence uh, evolution. Uh, during, at the beginning, the system is in a hard state. So the, the hardness luminosity diagram that you see on the right. Uh, so during the, at the beginning, the, the system is in a hard state uh, at low luminosity. During the first month, the system increases luminosity while keeping the hardness uh, in the spectrum. So the, the inverse Compton emission still dominates the, the energy output until it reaches a certain luminosity. And then the vertical evolution stops and then the system moves to the left. So to the softer part of the, of the diagram, but keeping the, the luminosity, the total luminosity of the system uh, approximately constant. Then after some erratic behavior, the system little by little decreases its luminosity, but keeping the softness. So the disk dominates during this vertical evolution here. And then at a certain lum low, lower luminosity, the, the system stops its vertical evolution and moves back to the hard state. It moves to the right, again, at a, at a constant luminosity. Not all the systems do the full cycle, but the, the system that, that that do this, this full cycle, they do it in a, in, in a counterclockwise clockwise direction. And this, um, so this evolution uh, defines this famous Q shape where the tail of the Q is in the hard 
uh, in the low hard part of the diagram. Uh, in a more schematic uh, view that you can see here, I'm showing the, the luminosity of the system in, in Eddington units against the disk fraction in the horizontal axis. So again, you have this famous Q shape and this behavior is called hysteresis. These loops are called hysteresis. And on, on the right side, you have the, the dominance, the, the, the hard state where, where the jet dominates. Then you have the intermediate states in the transition from hard to soft in the upper part, uh, in the upper intermediate state, you see radio flares in X-ray binaries. And then on the left side, you have the soft, uh, the soft uh, part of the diagram. Uh, where the, the disk is, domin is dominating the mission and the system tend to be radio quiet. So the, the jet shuts off during the, the soft state. There are two things I want you to, to remember from this figure. The first one is that the soft to hard transition occurs at almost always at 1% of the Eddington luminosity. So while the hard to soft transition at high luminosity may happen at different luminosities, even for the same system, for different outwards of the same system, the soft to hard transition occurs always at 1% Eddington. And that means that when the system is in a very low luminosity state, so below 1% Eddington, the spectrum of the source is always hard. So in other words, the jet dominates when the system is in the, in the tail of the Q, uh, of, of the Q shape uh, of this diagram. The, the presence of hysteresis is not only uh, detected in the spectral components, it also happens in the, in the timing properties of these sources. In this figure, you can see uh, the count rate in the, verti in the vertical axis against the characteristic amplitude of the flux variation for the same system, GX3394, during two cycles, uh, during two outbursts, the, the 2007 outbursts and, and another one in 2004. So as you can see, the, the transition from hard to soft happen at different luminosities, but soft to hard happens at the same one. And the, the variability, the, the amplitude of the variation shows the same, uh, the same hyster hysteresis behavior that you could see in the, in the, in the spectral components. Uh, moving to the, more to the accretion jet coupling, uh, I mentioned before that the, the jet corona dominates during the hard state. So, uh, and we already know uh, regarding the, the unification uh, with, uh, with AGNs, we already know that, the, that this, uh, this state is common and is present in AGNs. And we call it the fundamental plane of black hole accretion. Uh, in the figure of, of the left, you see a, a representation of the fundamental plane of black holes. This is a relation between three parameters, the X-ray luminosity, the radio luminosity, and the mass of the black hole. So when you normalize one of these parameters, for example, in this case, the X-ray luminosity is normalized by the mass of the black hole, you can fit in a single plane X-ray binaries like GX3394 uh, in in white triangles here, uh, Sagittarius A, and also low luminosity AGNs and radio galaxies uh, in, the, in the right side of the diagram. That means that the, the energy output is regulated by a jet and the jet physics applied uh, across the whole mass range from a few uh, solar masses to, to millions of, of solar masses. Uh, when, when a source, when X-ray binaries are in the hard state, they move in the vertical blue track in, the, in this diagram. And that means that they move along the, the fundamental plane of black hole accretion. So in the hard state, the unification between stellar mass and supermassive black hole is known. So the, the question now is, 
do AGN show accretion states in the, in the, for the rest of the diagram? Do they follow these, these, these tracks as discrete binaries do? We have two main problems to that, that, um, that hamper this, this, uh, the, the answer to this question. The first one is the long time scales. So you can, you can observe an X-ray binary and follow the, its evolution during, during one year and, and see the source uh, during the, the full cycle. But in AGNs, this is millions of years. So you cannot track the, the movement of one source uh, in, in, this, in this diagram. The second problem is the access to the disk continuum. In X-ray binaries, the, the disk uh, peaks in the X-rays and we have access to it. But in AGNs, the disk emission peaks in a, in a part of the, of the spectrum that it's completely absorbed by hydrogen in the host galaxies and also in our galaxy. So most of the disk emission is completely absorbed by, by, by the gas and uh, the red part of the, emission, of the accretion disk uh, in low luminosity system is completely dominated by the host galaxy luminosity. So it's very difficult to access to, the, to this component in AGN. Uh, the quest for AGN accretion states started very early, even, even before the unification theories in, 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 in AGNs. This is a, a paper by Penston and Perez in, in 84. And these authors propose that uh, an, evolution, an evolutionary sequence because they observe that the broad component of H beta uh, in, in the galaxy NGC 4151 disappeared in a period of about 10 years. Not only the broad component, but also the blue featureless continuum that is typically associated with the disk emission also disappeared in this period. So they suggested that, uh, that CIFR2 galaxies might be CIFR ones in which uh, the continuum, the, the, the central engines shut off uh, during some time. After that, the, the success of the, of the orientation dependent uh, interpretation in, in AGN uh, left the, the idea of, 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 uh, of accretion states in, in AGN aside. Uh, in, in the unified model for AGNs, the, the, the difference between type one and type two sources is uh, associated to the different line of sight uh, for one source or, 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 or others. So the, mm, the central engine where you have the black, the supermassive black hole and the, and the accretion disk is surrounded by a dusty structure called the torus that uh, blocks the, the direct uh, emission for certain line of, of sights. So for example, if you are looking at a, at a type one source uh, through a, a line of sight uh, close to the polar direction, you can directly see the accretion disk in the center. And so you can see the broad lines that are, that are uh, formed very close to the black hole and the, and the narrow emission lines that are formed uh, far away from the nucleus. However, if you look through a, edge on direction, uh, then the torus is blocking the direct emission from the, from the central part. And so you don't see the, the broad line region. And you only see in the spectrum the, the, the narrow line region from the gas located far away from the nucleus. The discovery of broad lines in the polarized spectrum of type two AGNs uh, created this, the, the gave birth to the idea of the, of the torus. And that was the, the impulse of the, the initial impulse that the that unification models had in the, in the late eighties and, er, and early nineties. However, recently the change, the, the, the idea of accretion states in AGM is resurfacing again, because the, the, vast monitoring of the sky in the, due, due to the surveys that have been performed in the, in the last decades, 
started to detect uh, uh, an increasingly number of, uh, of changing looking sources. So they do not see, uh, they do not seem to be any more rare objects, but they seem to be more and more common. Uh, one example, uh, two examples that, that they show here from Frederick in 2019, these are sources that uh, in a period of uh, about 20 years, uh, they change it. Uh, there is in, so in their spectrum, which was uh, mostly dominated by, by the stellar component, uh, in, in this period, the, the continuum flux increased by uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, you start to see the, the blue continuum associated with the disk emission and the broad, uh, the broad uh, lines appear in the, in the spectrum. Uh, so there are also back and forth transitions. Uh, there are systems that develop the broad lines and the, the blue featureless continuum, and then they came back to the, to the quiescent state. Uh, and this is not explained by, by variable absorption. For example, if you try to do the numbers to, to think that there is a cloud of, of, of a dusty cloud that it's moving uh, across the line of sight between the central engine and, and the observer, uh, you don't, the, the time scales that you recover are not consistent with the, with the time scale that you expect for the orbits of the, of the dusty gas around around these black holes. And the last thing I, uh, I wanted to mention here is the, that high excitation lines are responsive to the ionization continuum. And this is very interesting. It's not only the broad lines. In, the, in this figure, you can see a comparison between the, the brighter and the quiescent state for, for one source. The name of the source uh, it's written here. This, this is not a mistake. I did not fell on my keyboard by, by mistake. It's, it's just the name that the Swiki survey gives automatically to the, to the sources that vary. So in this source, uh, the, uh, besides the, the continuum and the broad lines, you can see that uh, high ionization coronal lines from iron appear in the, in the optical spectrum. In, in this period. And this is very interesting because it means that the, these lines are, are giving you information on the, on the ionizing continuum of the central source. Um, last, uh, another, um, another evidence that suggests that AGNs uh, show a creation state similar to, to those of, of X-ray binaries is the harder when brighter behavior during the, the low state and the softer when brighter behavior during the bright state. This means that uh, when the source is below 1% Eddington, the, the spectrum becomes harder, the, the spectral index becomes harder between the optical and the X and the X-rays. It becomes harder when the source become, becomes brighter. That means that the, the, the inverse Compton component is dominating the continuum emission in this case. However, eh, at higher accretion rates, about 1% Eddington, the behavior is reversed. So this is, this is known in X-ray binaries. And eh, in this figure, eh, the, the results by, by Ruan and collaborators show that changing the quasars move along the lines that you expect uh, that, that you expect to be is if the if the sources behave like like x-ray binaries so this inversion of the of the spectral index behavior with the eddington ratio this dependence is another evidence that point to the to the similarities between stellar mass and supermassive black holes and the last argument to to support the the, the fact that you expect uh, some evolution in the sources is comes from the from the black hole accretion rate density history in the universe. So, uh, from cosmological surveys, uh, we realized that the, there was a peak 
in, in the activity of black holes about 10 giga years ago, around Recif 2. And since that moment till today, the black hole accretion rate density in the universe have fallen by a factor of about 30. So that means that you expect a lot of quasars uh, 10 giga years ago that today uh, must be or should be in the, in the quiescent state. So this is another argument supporting the, the idea that, that the accretion states may, may be present in AGM. So one, one very important result uh, was obtained by Cording and collaborators. Uh, this is the, the first attempt to build a, a harness, the equivalent of a harness luminosity diagram for AGMs. These authors uh, use a, a survey of uh, a sample of quasars in, in Sloan with information in X-rays and, and radio frequencies at 1.4 gigahertz. And they built uh, a representation of the, of the luminosity of this system against the disk fraction. The luminosity is simply the total luminosity. This is not expressed in Ellington units. And the disk fraction represents the, the relative contribution from the disk compared to the, to the total uh, disk plus jet emission, disk plus uh, inverse Compton emission. So um, the idea behind this, this diagram is that you cannot track the evolution of a single AGN source, but if you observe a, a population that is large enough, different sources should be at different accretion states. So the, the, the diagram for the whole population should track the, the different accretion states in AGN. And they, they obtain a very important result, which is that uh, power low dominated quasars, so quasars where the inverse Compton component is, is more important, are radio louder. Those are the darker regions in the, in the diagram that you see here. So that means that when the, the inverse, when the disk is less uh, prominent, the jet is, is more, uh, dominates more uh, the, the energy output in these systems. The, the, this, this study had some limitation. The first one is that the, they don't have uh, black hole estimates for the sources. So that means that you are plotting total luminosities and not, uh, not luminosity in Eddington units. So if you have black holes of from 10 to the six to 10 to the nine uh, solar masses, then you expect a, a scatter in the vertical axis of about two to three orders of magnitude. And that's a limitation because uh, it blurs the diagram and, and does not allow you to, to properly see the, the Q shape that you have in, in X-ray binaries. The second limitation is that um, the disk continuum cannot be accessed in the, in the optical for faint sources because the galaxy dominates. So these authors incorporate a sample of liners to the diagram, but the, the disk emission in these liners is estimated just from the H beta emission using a correlation. So even though they fall more or less in the part of the diagram that, that you expect, uh, you are not really proving the disk emission in these systems. And that's a limitation to, to, to compare uh, with, the, with the X ray binaries, where to, to, to really prove that, the, that, the, that you have the, the characteristic Q shape um, that hysteresis uh, produce. So, um, our approach was to use a sample of 167 AGM that had uh, spectra from Spitzer and to solve the problem of the, or to amend the problem of the, of the unknown black hole mass, we used the, the stellar sigma measured from the optical spectra of these sources to estimate the black hole mass. So the, the M sigma using the M sigma relation. So this is a relation between the black hole mass and the velocity dispersion of the stars in the bulge. You can estimate the, the mass of the black holes in this system. 
for those with dynamical measurements, we use the dynamical measurements, and for the others, we use this, the, the M sigma relation. The M sigma relation has a scatter of 0.3 dex, and so that means that we reduce the vertical scatter in the, the previous figure by a factor of 10. And that's very useful to, to, to really um, uh, clarify the, the diagram. The second uh, thing that we do is to use the nebula lines in the infrared to prove the emission from the discontinuum. So in, in this figure, you can see the, the spectrum of an AGN, the, the luminosity against the, the ionization potential of the, uh, of the, uh, the energy of the radiation. And the vertical lines represent the ionization potential of the different ionic species. So the infrared lines allows you to map the part of the spectrum, of the primary spectrum of AGN that it's absorbed by hydrogen. So you don't have access to this region here, but the information on the shape of the ionizing continuum is encoded in the, in the, in the gas, in the lines that receive that, that, that continuum, that ionizing continuum. So using the information from these lines, you can somehow, some, at first order, reconstruct the shape of the, of the ionizing continuum. And the idea in, the, in this case is to use oxygen-4 and neon-2 lines, which uh, map uh, 55 electron volts and 22 electron volts uh, to uh, prove the presence of the, of the disk emission in the system. So a schematic representation to, to illustrate this is, is this diagram here. On the right part, you have the, the input spectrum. So you have uh, the, the continuum from the AGN, and, and this big bump here represents the, the emission from the accretion disk. So the accretion disk ionized the narrow line region and excite the, the, the lines and the transition here. You take the spectrum of that part, and when the disk is present, because you reach high energies, you can enhance or you can produce bright oxygen for emission when compared to neon two. Uh, that's because the, the ionization potential of oxygen four is, is high, and, and you reach that energy with the, with the photons from the disk. During the low state, the the, the, the disk is truncated, so you don't you lose the inner orbits of the accretion disk around the black hole, and that means that you lose the most energetic uh, photons to ionize the gas. So your spectrum would be something like the blue line in this figure. It's a, a um, series of power laws representing the synchrotron emission and the inverse quantum emission. And this spectrum can ionize the gas, but it's less powerful than, than, than the disk. And so you would have less oxygen for emission and more neon to emission. So that's the idea behind the diagram that we built. So we call it the luminosity excitation diagram, the LED diagram. In the vertical axis, uh, we are plotting the, the total luminosity of the system in Eddington units using the, the black hole estimate. Uh, from the M sigma relation for most of the systems. And on the horizontal axis, we are defining a parameter called the Lyman hardness. The Lyman hardness is simply a combination of neon two and oxygen four fluxes. So it's neon two over the total neon two plus oxygen four. That means that uh, when, when the disk is not present, you have little oxygen four and then this ratio go, moves to the right part of the diagram, closer to one. When the disk is present, you produce a, a significant amount of oxygen four, and then the systems move to the high excitation part of the diagram on the left, to lower values of the Lyman hardness. In this case, we are um, adopting uh, as luminosity of the system the total oxygen four plus neon two luminosity. This is because the, the statistics was, was better because we had this information for all the sources. 
But we compare these values with um, Eddington luminosities derived from, from X-rays, and they are in agreement for, for many of these systems. So uh, in the figure, you can see a representation of the, uh, of the agents in the, in the sample as separated by, by spectral class. The red triangles correspond to Cipher 1 galaxies. The, the pink squares, the, the pink diamond, correspond to hidden uh, broad line. Uh, so, so correspond to Cipher galaxies with hidden broad lines. Those are uh, type two uh, AGNs that have broad lines in polarized light or in infrared light. And in green, the green squares correspond to Cipher 2s. And finally, the, the blue circles correspond to liner galaxies. So as you can see, the overall shape of the diagram reminds to the, to the Q-shape uh, diagram for X-ray binaries. You have the, the, the tail of the, the, the tail of the Q, uh, which is mostly dominated by liners. And then you have a, a very wide uh, range in excitation at high luminosities. So one, one of the important things is that um, at low luminosities, you always have low excitation. So that means that when the luminosity falls below um, 1% to 1 per thousand uh, Eddington, all the systems move to the low excitation part of the diagram. That indicates that the disk emission disappears at low luminosities. So you don't have like dwarf Cifert one galaxies. They do not exist. When the systems go dimmer, they move to, to low excitation. And that's, that's irrespective of, of their spectral type. So uh, they are mostly liners. So systems with low excitation are, are mostly liners, but you also find here some few type one and type two AGNs. They even despite their optical classification, they have low excitation when they, uh, when, when this is measured using the oxygen four line. Um, the second thing, which is important, is that this transition happens at about 10 to the minus three in Eddington units. This is somewhat lower than the value that, that we saw in, in, in X-ray binaries, which is 1% Eddington. So it seems that for AGNs, this value, it's, it's a bit lower. And the, the, the other thing that is very important is that the systems, when they move to, to low excitations, they become radio loud. So the symbols in this figure are color coded uh, depending on their uh, radio to X-ray radiation. So this is a measure of the, of the radio loudness of the systems. Uh, systems with uh, black color are more radio loud and system with clear uh, color are, are uh, radio quiet. So the system, uh, the, the, the system that have, that have uh, more radio loud emission are those with low excitation. And that indicates that at low excitation, the jets dominate the emission in, in these galaxies, in these nuclei. This is in agreement, the, the overall behavior that we observe in, in, in excitation is in agreement with photoionization models. So we, we uh, compute some photoionization models uh, using the, as input spectrum, the disk emission that we see here in this figure. And those were compared with uh, photoionization models using this power law input spectrum. So the disk emission predicts values uh, that cover the range observed for systems uh, with high excitation, the system with disks emission. And for the power law systems, even at uh, high ionization parameter values, you don't, uh, you don't go beyond a certain threshold in, in Lyman hardness excitation. 
So even if you increase the rate of ionizing photons, because the spectrum is very steep in this, in this range, you cannot, um, you cannot produce a significant amount of oxygen fog in order to, to move uh, this, this system to the, to the left part of the diagram. So now, after uh, from the previous diagram, we derived the, the probability density using a, a Gaussian kernel to, to recover the, the 2D, the, the, the probability distribution based on the, on the for, for each population, for each spectral class, for each kind of, of AGM type. So in this diagram, you can see that the uh, Cipher one galaxies, uh, the, the red area covers uh, a wide range in excitation and they are uh, mostly, uh, uh, they, they dominate the, the part of the diagram with high luminosities, high Eddington luminosities and high excitation. The, uh, the, the, the type one uh, galaxies with hidden broad lines, uh, Corresponding to the, the pink color, agrees very well with the with the cipher ones, with the with the broad line uh, galaxies. Liners are on the right side of the diagram, and they cover a very wide range in luminosity. So you have liners from ten to the minus five, even almost ten to the minus six in Eddington uh, luminosity, up to almost uh, 0.1, uh, 0.1 Eddington luminosity. And cipher twos, they appear to show uh, a bimodal distribution. The statistics is, is not very high, but you see some sources that uh, fall closer to the cipher one galaxies and some others that uh, fall at high luminosities, but low excitation, closer to the upper side of the of the liner distribution. On the sides, you can see the, the marginal distributions in, in the histograms. So we identify uh, low luminosity AGNs, so low luminosity liners as sources in the hard state because they are consistent with, uh, with a power low continuum dominated by the jet and uh, they have, they, in this diagram, they show low excitation and low luminosity. These are the sources that fall in the tail of the queue. Then we identify as uh, soft state agents, those uh, in, the, in the upper left, left side of the, of the diagram. So those where the disk is prominent and it's, uh, it's exciting the gas, and then you have high excitation and high luminosity. So those are the systems that, uh, that are consistent with being disk dominated. And then sources in the upper side, so in the high luminosities, but, but low excitation. So half, about half of the cipher twos and the, the bright liners, they are consistent with sources in the intermediate state. So these, these would be sources that uh, would be in transition from, uh, from the hard state to the soft state. Uh, and an important thing here is, is that, as you can see, liners, they, they fall in, in, in two classes and they cover a very, a very wide range in luminosity. So liners is, a, is a, a very heterogeneous class. And in this figure, uh, this figure suggests that you should divide liners and separate those sources with, with high luminosities. Typically these are uh, Euler galaxies. These liners fall in, in Euler galaxies, galaxies with high star formation rates and, and high star formation activity. And, uh, when you compare that to liners in the lower side of the diagram, they are typically found in, in more elliptical systems. So um, you should take care with the, um, with the liner definition, not, not to mix these sources because they, they, they cover a very wide range in, in, in Eddington luminosity. 
So a more uh, schematic uh, view of the system of, of the, this idea is, is this figure where you can see uh, just the, the probability distribution, not the, not the individual points. So the, the horizontal axis represent the disk luminosity and the, and the vertical axis is the, is the total luminosity. During the soft state, you would have the, the disk dominating the emission. And then during the hard state, it would be the jet. Uh, um, an important addition in this figure is the gray area that you can see on the, on the right side. Uh, so to, to define this area, we, we build, uh, we, we derive again the, the probability distribution, but uh, we put together all the sources and we weight them by the, by the, by the radio loudness, uh, estimated as, as the radio over X radio emission. So as you can see here, the radio loud population, uh, it's in very good agreement with the, with the distribution of, of soft, of hard state sources. And that uh, uh, indicates that is another evidence suggesting that the, the jet indeed dominates during, during the hard state. So uh, the question now is what, what is happening with the X-ray binary population? So we cannot track the evolution of a single AGN source, but we can mix the evolution. You could, we can mix the outward cycles of the X-ray population and see if we recover the same that we see for, for AGNs. Well, the, the answer is yes. When you mix different, um, different uh, X-ray binaries in, into the same diagram and you represent the luminosity in Eddington units, um, and the, the, the fraction, uh, the fraction of the of the disk over the of the jet over the total disk plus plus jet emission on the horizontal axis, you realize that they they uh, they show a very similar shape as uh, as the um, probability distribution that we see for for AGMs. The, um, the sources that you can see here in, in the vertical lines on the, on the right side of, of the figure is just sources that are completely dominated by the, by the power law from the inverse Compton and, and they have zero this contribution. So uh, the conclusion from, from, from this comparison is that uh, the, the, we recover, so for AGMs, we are recovering the, the mix of, of, the, of the population uh, covering the different states that, that you observe in X-ray binaries when you follow that population uh, uh, for, for several outboard cycles. And the last uh, part, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we, we did also a comparison with the, some properties of the host galaxies. Uh, in particular, I'm showing here the same um, the same LED diagram, so the, the luminosity of the central engine in Eddington units against the excitation. But now the sources are color coded uh, uh, depending on the star formation rate uh, in, in the central region of these galaxies. So to derive the, the star formation rate, we are using the, the PAH emission at 11.3 uh, microns. Uh, so the the aperture, the, the, the emission is coming relatively from the same region, uh, from the same region as, as we are measuring the, the oxygen and, and neon lines. And um, we are translating the, the pH flux into star formation rate. So uh, as you can see, the, the sources with the, with the higher star formation rates are those in the in the left in the right upper part of the diagram, so typically sources with low disk contribution and high uh, high uh, luminosity they have star formation rates of about uh, ten to to one hundred uh, solar masses per year. Uh, type one sources, uh, the ones that are uh, clearly dominated by the disk emission, they tend to show uh, smaller star formation rates. And then liners, sources in the, in the hard state, so not liners, but low luminosity AGNs in the hard state, 
they show very little star formation. That means that these are sources that you find in, in elliptical galaxies or, or, or in, in early type spirals. And from this diagram, one, one could speculate of a possible evolutionary sequence. So you would start with a Euler-like uh, source uh, with, with a bright uh, nucleus, but uh, not dominated by the disk, and then a lot of star formation. Then the quasar phase or the Cipher one phase would come after that when the star formation is, is already uh, lower, but the, the active nucleus becomes brighter. And then after that, the galaxy uh, the, the stellar population of the galaxy becomes older and also the, the emission from the, from the black hole, uh, which does not have more fuel to, to, to accrete, becomes weaker and moves to the harder state. So that's, uh, that's a possible scenario that, that, uh, and that's a, an idea that, that we would like to, to investigate uh, further in the, in the future. So uh, finally, this is, uh, this is my summary. Uh, the conclusions are that nebular infrared lines are excellent proofs of the ionizing continuum, and they are promising tracers to, to sense the, the shape of the uh, continuum emission in, in AGNs where you don't have a direct access due to, to the absorption by hydrogen. We conclude that supermassive black holes show accretion states similar to, to those in, in X-ray binaries, and this uh, suggests that a more accretion-oriented AGN classification beyond the, the, the classical optical spectral types should be, should be used, should be implemented. And, and, uh, and for the future, uh, spectroscopic studies with James Webb, Euclid, and, and WFIRST can be used to, to explore this, this scenario. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and questions. Thank you, Juan Antonio. Thank you very much for the for the seminar, for the talk. And now the the talk is open for the question. Please uh, raise your hand if you want to make a question. For doing that, press the button reactions, and then you can raise your hand. Okay, here we have one by Rainer. Please, Rainer. Hi, thanks a lot. I, I like to hear about these things with, with X-ray binaries and AGN. I remember time working on that. So, so thank you very much. Very interesting. And uh, I, think, um, I think you're onto something there. Of course, probably the real picture is, I'm sure also you have to mix in the, the orientation model there as well. And, whatever it's, yeah, it's sure, complicated sure. i have a very basic question nevertheless um it's something i never dare to ask but in this uh, typical diagram of the cycle of x-ray binaries with a soft low state a high hard mm -hmm. state etc this is a very basic ignorance but i always learned that where there's accretion uh, there are jets to carry away angular momentum, et cetera. So we always see accretion disks and jets together, but in the X-ray binaries, in the end, we, we do not see a jet when we see an accretion disk. So have, is there something that we have fundamentally wrong about accretion? So I, it, it, it really no. calls my attention. So we have, if we have a classical accretion disk, we do not have a jet. So maybe it would also be interesting to, to pull that together with what happens in protostars or other objects. Can you, I don't know, it's, it's a very wide and maybe weird and, and, and fundamentally ignorant question, but, but it really confuses me always. Well, I, I myself, I, I, I'm not an expert in X-ray binaries, but the, the thing is that you don't, you don't completely lose the disk. The disk is always there and, and you can see that it recedes. The thing is that the jet becomes brighter and probably the, what the theory tells you is that the, the disk becomes colder in the hard state. Uh, it it loses the it loses the innermost orbits, and then you have this uh, advection flow that dominates the the matter transfer in the in the inner part closer to the black hole. 
And then when you when you miss the photons from the disk, that that is the those are needed for the color for the corona to cool down through inverse Compton emission. So when you lose the disk, then the the corona the, the inverse Compton emission the corona becomes hotter and, the, and okay. the inverse Compton emission becomes much brighter. Okay, that's so when the, that's when the jet takes control. Okay, so is my error maybe thinking that, uh, okay, I think I see my error. The jet is always there. I'm not sure because this diagram is typically painted that you have a jet in the hard state and you don't have it in the soft state. But actually, I think that is probably a misrepresentation. So the jet is always there. You just don't see it easily in the soft state. Is that correct? So basically, the relative brightness of the jet is much higher in the in a hard state, but it's not, it's not that the jet may be as bright in the soft state as it is in a hard state in terms of total energy or mass outflow, but you just don't see it and it's far more dominant in the hard state. Is that the the yeah, yeah, that that that's it. So I would not say that the jet is always there, but the, the corona is always there and the corona forms the jet when, when it becomes hotter. So it, it, for example, in the intermediate states between the the transition at high luminosity between hard and soft, you see radio flares there. So these blobs of emission uh, happen uh, when the sources are moving from the hard to the soft. So it seems that the, this collimated emission becomes more discontinuous when, when, the, when the corona is cooling down. So yeah, okay. I have to ask somebody next so, time I hear you see one of these X-ray people, but the uh, X-ray binary people, because it, it really, I mean, yeah. They always paint it like there's no jet in the soft state. Or is it yeah, then probably, more difficult? Probably they, they, they are right. They are right if, if you mean that there is no collimated emission, but you still have synchrotron emission from the from the particles in the corona. You expect to have that uh, always. But of course, it's less intense, and that's why they become radio quiet. But they, they are they don't become radio silent. Is there any explanation what happens? Okay, I guess we don't know enough about jets, how they get launched and why they do not get launched from a, from a dense disk, but they do get launched when the disk recedes. Do we have any idea why this happens? Uh, what, sorry, can you repeat the way? Do we have any idea why basically a disk that reaches all the way down to the central object quenches the jet? Why does it kill because, a because collimate? Because it, because it cools the corona. That's that's the idea that I have. So uh, if you have a lot of uh, optical photons, those, uh, those are accelerated. Uh, th those collide with the electrons, with the leptons around the, the black hole. And so the, the particles in the corona, they cool down because they transfer energy to the optical photons. The optical becomes X-ray through inverse Compton. And that's how you cool the corona. And then because the corona is colder, then the jet, it's weaker. Thanks. Thank you, Rainer. Another question for uh, Juan Antonio? So I see no more questions. Thank you again, Juan Antonio, for, for this talk. Thank um, you very much. To, yeah. And to everybody. For, for the, the, for the yeah. people at IAEA, I will be here till, till October 20th. So um, feel free to, to pass by. And, and, um, and where are you, please? At en Enrique Perez Montero's office. So in it's uh, building C and upstairs. Upper floor. Okay, thank you very much, Juan Antonio, and see you uh, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.